another episode of The Seminary Up Close. I'm Stephen Heiner, and with me, as always, is the rector of the seminary, His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn. Hello, Your Excellency. Hello again, Stephen. So today we're going to talk about who can who can come to the seminary, and this is due to the fact I help answer some of the emails here, and there's always all sorts of questions. One that I got the other day, which I thought was very funny, is, I'm a foreigner, can I come to the seminary? <laughs> and my first thought was half the seminary is foreigners, half of the seminary professors are foreigners. Yes. Um, so I suppose that's the first question. Can foreigners come to the seminary? Oh, of course they can. We have, uh, oh, since 1995, we have had approval to receive foreign students from the government. And uh, there's a process and they get a student visa. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, it you know, it just involves a few steps. They go to the consulate or the embassy and uh, they uh, give them a visa unless there's some problem. Uh, but uh, there was only one that uh, I had turned down, but I came to f find out later that he purposely made the wrong responses on the application in order to be turned down uh, because he didn't want to come here. Somebody else wanted him to come here, but he didn't want to come here. So he that's the only one own... that, that I had trouble with. Um, I did have a little bit of trouble with uh, Father Nkamaki. Uh He had an engineering degree, and he approached the embassy in Nigeria, and they couldn't believe that he was going to be a priest. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually had to go to the local congresswoman in Florida and ask her to send uh, some sort of communication to the, the consulate in order to assure them that this was something legitimate. And that worked. Oh, it's one of those times right away. <laughs> your, your, your congressman works for you. Yes, That's a wonderful yes. thing. I, I think I remember Father Saavedra had 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 one of his visas lapse. I think he had just forgotten about it, but the rules had changed slightly. So you had to do a bit of paperwork to get... Well, his, he, his no, next... he was outside of the student visa at that time. He okay. was on a uh, what they call an R1 visa, which is a uh, religious worker. Uh, it's, you know, priests come in on that. And uh, that lapsed, and he was in Mexico, and, and uh, there, was, there was a big complicated <laughs> mess to get him back. Right. Yes, but no, that we have student visas. So as long as there's students here, they can come in and out. All right. Another question I, I see a lot is, I'm old. Uh, am I allowed to come? Because they go to the seminary, frequently ask questions for vocations page, and they see that there is an age limit there. And so they say, well, I'm not of that age limit, so am I disqualified? So what is the answer there? In principle, if you are over 25, you're disqualified in principle. But let me, uh, let me explain all of that. If you are over 25 and you, and this is my experience from, I've been running seminaries for probably 40 years. Uh, if you uh, have no previous seminary experience or, or no, you, this is just a, a new start for you. No previous religious experience. Right, you know, it's something like a religious brother or something like that. You have about a 10% chance of making it to the priesthood. And people will hear that and just gasp, Your Excellency, why so dire? Well, it's just, uh, I am not sure it's different in each case, but most of the time they just run out of steam. They don't have the, the oomph, you might say, to get through the studies and all of the training, uh, the determination. Uh, they uh, just often fail, you know, and not that they're unintelligent or, you know, they might be very talented, but they just uh, often don't have the enthusiasm to do it. So yeah, that's what I've noticed. Uh, that they, they just decide they don't want to do this. You know? And uh, so, but some do make it. Uh, and, uh, but I would say it's probably about 10%. Well, I, I suppose the most success that we've seen recently, I, I'm Father Desai is an example, they already had some previous formation oh, yes, yes. and they've been living that life even though, let's say, it was in the Novus Ordo, so it makes it more likely that they will persevere. Oh, yes. That's a whole different case. I'm talking about people who come in uh, from really nothing, no, no seminary background, no clerical background, just many times it's, uh, well, I don't know what to do with my life, so maybe I should become a priest, and <laughs> that will never work. You have to have uh, plenty of fuel in you to, in order to make it to the end. It, it's, a, it's a long, hard road. To become a priest, and it, in 
and it's not an easy life. I can't imagine anyone saying that. It's like someone saying, well, I never gonna, haven't done anything with life. I might as well become an astronaut or I might as well become president. <laughs> you know, Becoming a priest, I don't know why someone would think that's a default setting. Uh, well, nothing else has worked out for me, so I think I'll well, be a priest. Well, sometimes it, it, that's true. And also maybe that they, they have not succeeded in romance. In other words, that they haven't found a spouse. And, uh, well, maybe I'll become a priest. Maybe God wants me to become a priest because because there's no women to marry. And that's not a good motive. <laughs> it's <laughs> That will never make it. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, they might be very, very virtuous men, but uh, I just know from, that's my experience, it's about 10%. Okay. I don't have any money to pay for the seminary. Nobody does. <laughs> 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 Uh, the we the it costs us approximately fifteen thousand dollars a year to train a seminarian. Uh, that's out of pocket expenses. We ask for five thousand from the seminarians. We get about twenty percent uh, of that from the seminarians themselves. Seminarians or their families, and those are in most cases the Americans. Foreigners generally don't have any money. And, and sometimes their currency is worth even less. Right. It depends on where they're from. Many times Europeans might have some you know, money, but uh, if they're coming from second or third world countries, uh, there's just no money. You know, so uh, we count on the benefactions of our uh, people to, uh, to make up for that. Uh, my, my parents aren't married or my parents are Protestant and they disapprove of this. Well, it, the, in canon law, you cannot be, it's an impediment to become a priest if your parents are not properly married. In other words, if you are an illegitimate child. Uh, however, that can be dispensed by the local bishop, you see. And I think that the when that law was made, marriage was a, a very, very sacred and respected institution socially. Cross-culturally. Yes, now it has completely fallen apart. So there are many, many cases of that now. And also the, the opprobrium, you see, it has nothing to do with the person himself. It's the opprobrium that might reflect upon the priesthood. That is gone. I mean, if somebody said, you know, my parents were not properly married, no one would care as long as you're a good priest, you know. So that is easily dispensed. There are some institutions that are still quite strict on this issue. Yes, they are. You know, it's uh, but I, I think that the, you know, times change and laws change with them. And we haven't had been able to change a law since 1958. So, you know, there has to be, a, I think, a certain leeway and a certain rational, how would you say, accommodation for that. OK. And as far as my parents are Protestant and they think it's terrible for me to be here. It's really ultimately none of their business what you do with your life, and especially if you are giving it to God. I mean, God is your true Father in heaven, and and He has uh, first, you know, uh, he, he can require you to do whatever He wants you to do, and uh, they really no parent should stand in the way, whether Catholic or non-Catholic, should stand in the way of a vocation. That would be a terrible thing. I, they they phrased it in different ways, but something along the lines of I'm worried about Latin studies, or I, I don't know that I'm the brightest bulb in, in the bunch. Have you heard that objection before? Yes. And how would you? Well, we look at their academic records. It, you have to be of average intelligence to make it through. If you are of average intelligence and you work hard, you will make it through. If you are of average intelligence and you don't work hard, you will flunk out. Mm -hmm. uh, those who are very intelligent uh, will not breeze through by any stretch of the imagination, but they will find it a little bit easier. Uh, there's, a, there's Latin, which requires a lot of academic discipline. It's not, language is not a hard thing. It's just work. And the more work you put in, the better you, you get it. It's not difficult, but what is difficult is the abstract philosophy and theology. That, that students find difficult because it's a whole new world of thinking. And the more intelligent you are, the, more, the easier it is to abstract. You see, that's really the measure of intelligence is, is your ability to abstract. 
And so people who are not quite as intelligent will find it more difficult. You know, they, they get into a philosophy book and it's like Chinese. <laughs> it's, uh, but they, they can get it. They might be C students, but they will get through. You see, C means bene in Latin. That means good. You know, they, they shouldn't be ashamed of a C around here. It's, it's, uh, it, you did well, you see. Uh, but A is optime. That means the best. So uh, the, um, it's not to worry as long. It's mostly work. But if you are, I would say, below average intelligence, uh, and we try to determine that when we interview and also when we look at your academic records, or if your study habits are very bad and you've never really done serious studies in your high school, you know, where you never applied yourself, you probably won't make it. All right. Uh, I, I am either undecided on a thesis or I'm, I'm a committed totalist. Could I, could I come to the seminary? Well, the seminary has the policy of neutrality on totalism versus thesis. In other words, that uh, we do not require you to to accept the what we call the thesis of Gerard de Laurier. Uh, but you're going to be among people <laughs> who are very convinced <laughs> of the thesis, I'll say that. And all the priests belong to the Roman Catholic Institute, which does require adherence to the thesis. So... Uh, you might get a few arguments, let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, uh, you'll have to defend yourself, but, but also then you would have to find an entity that would accept you, you see. So, so I think the, the mark is at tonsure. So by the time they're tonsure, they either have to opt to join the Institute, which, which obviously you have to hold a thesis or to have an agreement, a working agreement with, uh, clergy who we know of and feel comfortable with. we approve with. of, yes. But they may not necessarily hold to the thesis. So this would be someone like Father Zapp that we know, for example, or Father Savedra. I don't Father know if Savedra. he holds, I really don't oh, know no, 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 not, not, not whether they, they hold the thesis, yeah. but these are approved clergy that we know of that are not members of the Institute. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, there's a number of approved clergy that are not members of the Institute. But uh, the um, uh, Bishop Neville, for example, you know, that he's not a member of the Institute. But uh, the uh, he I think he does adhere to the thesis, uh, but the, uh, uh, so it, that's the policy of the seminary. You see. Well, I think you've answered probably ninety percent of the most frequent questions that we get in in the contact us form. You're seeing. I think probably the most important message is for for people who have these objections to ask them and not to be scared off necessarily by the by the frequently asked questions, because as you said, there's greater context mm -hmm. for things. And if they're interested in pursuing a vocation, the very first step is to put in an application. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also on the, on the age thing, uh, sometimes I make uh, exceptions, but I will tell somebody that, you know, your chances are not as good as if you were entering at 20. But there are exceptions. Every case is a little different. You know, the, what background they come from, you know, if it's a very, very strong traditional background, or if they were impeded, for example, from entering a seminary because they didn't know about our seminary, mm. where they had a vocation, but where would I go? You see, that that's a factor too. You see, but what what is almost entirely uh, where you have the ten percent uh, chance is in people who say, "Well, I don't know what to do with my life. Maybe I'll become a priest." <laughs> <laughs> that's about ten percent. <laughs> Well, as always, Sir Sissi, thank you for your time.